Bwana asifiwe. Let us stand and pray. Father in Jesus name, we thank you this evening even as we begin sharing from your word i pray may you minister may you speak to each one of us may you enable us to understand your word may your spirit cause us to, to come to a position of understanding and revelation in jesus name we pray amen we in chapter 4 uh revelation chapter 4 and i think the last thing was a uh, about the c for 6 is that right the c of uh glass which we linked with what uh, solomon had in the temple and we said uh, in the day of uh, uh john you you did not need now to bathe we only needed to see our reflection there now for 7 the bible says And the first that's revelation chapter 4 from verse 7 and the first living creature was like a lion the second living creature like a calf and the third living creature had a face as a man and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle now after mentioning the the do i call them the I'm avoiding the word creature. The things around the throne because he has talked about the elders, 24 elders, and now he talks about the what the Bible calls the four living creatures. John goes to a little bit a detailed description of the creatures that he is talking about. <coughs> Sorry. Now, if you look at this description and you go back to Ezekiel and uh, like I told you some of the things uh, John saw more or less are described also by Ezekiel and also in a, in, in a modified form sometimes they are also explained in Daniel but Ezekiel and uh, John uh, more or less because they saw the throne their description will be a bit closer that's why according to to Ezekiel the 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 these four living creatures looked like a wheel in another wheel and according to him they were they had eyes everywhere according to John they had eyes in front and behind but you listen to the description you realize more or less it's like they are describing the same but according to what John saw The first living creature the face looked like that of a lion the second the second one it looked like a calf the third one uh it looked like a man the fourth one was like a flying eagle now many different schools of thought you may if i may call them that have tried to explain the significance of these creatures uh and uh, it's a bit hard to set on one of them because those who go by trying to say it, it was just uh, the, the living creatures are uh, more or less a representation of the of what we call the animal kingdom of course you go back to biology you realize no there is something that is not adding up because if you were to use that uh, classification you know of uh, the animal kingdom then you would say you are missing a reptile right because here you have an eagle bird you have a uh, carnivore you have a uh, herbivore you have uh, man was supposed to be what uh, whatever that was and then you would realize you are missing a reptile and that would mean uh, reptiles are not uh, welcome in god's presence which would uh, Uh, uh create another problem all together but the best approach is this when the bible leaves some things unexplained the best way is to trust god with that uh, economy of uh, information and just you know uh, con- uh comfort yourself by saying 
the Lord knows why there are four living creatures and why uh, they re- they look one of them looks like a lion, another like a calf, another like a a, a a man, and the other one like an eagle. The reason being this: when you see the Bible omitting some detailed information, and I think I I I, I insinuated that when we are talking about now the invitation that uh, John received. Come up hither and I will show you the things that are to come. If the Bible, if, even after such an open invitation, if the Lord, if the spirit that was now speaking to, 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 to John did not bother to give detailed description, then it means those descriptions, the details about those creatures uh, may actually do not really matter. And that's why uh, if you can leave it at that, you'll play safer. And I'm not saying you shy away from derogating what the Bible says. I'm just trying to draw a line between what we call foolish curiosity and someone who just wants to understand exactly what it is God wanted to pass. In other words, even if you were to classify like some schools of thought that these are herbivores, carnivores, birds, and uh, and uh, whatever, omnivores, it really does not add a lot of value to the understanding of the book or to the overall uh, theme and message of the book of Revelation. We need to avoid, and I will keep on repeating this, because anytime you study what we call the Apocrypha, uh, beginning with a, a book like Revelation, the portions of Ezekiel where he saw the visions, the portions of Daniel where he's talking about visions, uh, where the Lord chose to explain, then uh, you, 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 you get the meaning. Where he doesn't bother to explain, then do not try to create, rather to put words in God's mouth. Suffice it to say that John saw four creatures, uh, uh, he calls them living creatures, meaning they were not just images. You know, in the Temple of Solomon, like the, the sea of, uh, the, the, the molten sea, rather, was placed on, uh, uh, I'm avoiding the word image. Like, uh, what do you call that thing now that you make with a, a mold of a, a oxen? Four facing this side, four the other side, four the other side, and then that, uh, a big ball of brass was placed on top. When John insists on calling them living creatures, he wants to differentiate. These are not like the ones that were in Solomon's temple, which were just uh, 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 carvings or rather molded images. These are actually creatures who are alive. And unlike in the temple of Solomon, all of them were oxen facing the four points of the canvas. These ones are different. Each one is having a different uh, face. And to me, the most, uh, 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 is it a reasonable explanation is just to say, God wanted to put this picture before John that even when you are talking about my throne, there are different aspects, or rather, uh, depending on which side you are coming, uh, uh, you are approaching the throne, you are likely to see a different, uh, I'm very careful in using face of God because we just saw John does not describe, he says there was one who sat on the throne and like we saw, he doesn't describe that one. And we saw even in the time of Moses, there was no description of, they say they saw the God of Israel, but no one bothers to, to, to describe. But, and this is something that as you delve deeper into now what we call religion, you can very easily understand. Many times a person's understanding of uh, God, forget about now idols, <coughs> the real God, sometimes you may find you, are, you have this limited understanding of God because if I may use this picture, because these are four living creatures, and the Bible says they were surrounding the throne and in the midst of the throne. Meaning if you were approaching from a certain angle, if you are seeing the face of a bird, if you limit yourself to that, God will be, you will know one first, uh, uh, aspect of God and not the other. And that's one of the things we keep talking about when we actually begin to talk about knowing the fullness of God. Because it's possible uh, to 
to know the true God, but you know so little about him that you only know one side of him. Remember Abraham, the Bible says when God now came to talk to Moses, he told him, by my name, Almighty, I did not appear to Abraham. I only appeared to him by my name, Jehovah. And now the Lord was telling uh, Moses, when it comes to Pharaoh, I'm going to manifest, I'm going to show myself using a different name. Pharaoh is going to know me in a somewhat different way than how uh, your father Abraham knew me. And that was supposed to let Moses know, uh, and that's why even many musicians over the ages, they keep on talking about uh, majina, you, you know, mungu alia na majina mengi, majina yote mazuri ni yako, because you can very easily know God as God, uh, you know, these many names, especially in the Old Testament. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. But you still need to know him as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. And uh, you still need to know him as the Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Otherwise, you will only keep on saying, my God provides a lamb. And then one day he comes to you as the man of war, Jehovah Sabaoth, and you'll be like, uh, is this the God I know? So I think the best approach would be to <coughs> look at it from that point that God wanted uh, uh, John to see that from whatever angle you approach me, there are living creatures, there are faces you may see, but to try to link why this face and not, or rather what the face of a man represents, it will not add a lot of value to the offer or message of the book. Now, verse 8. And the four living creatures had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest day, uh, no, they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, if you listen to that description, you realize especially about the six wings, that description is given very clearly by Isaiah in chapter 6. He says in the year, you know, King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and, uh, you know, and then he begins to talk about, uh, there he calls them the, is it the seraphims, cherubims, and then he begins to say they had six wings, two to fly. That's now according to Isaiah. Two to cover their face, and two to cover their feet. Now, here, he does not, uh, John does not explain how the wings were being used. But now you can get those details from the book of Isaiah. Now, uh, I do not want to go into the significance really, but uh, on the surface you realize this uh, simply was to show the, if they are flying with two wings, then you are talking of mobility. Then they have covered their their faces, and then you are talking of that reference that uh, even when they are angels, angelic beings, or whichever form of creation, they do not even want to see God. They, they cover their faces because they feel we are not uh, worthy to behold this one before whom we are standing. That shows you a lot of reference. Then they covered their feet. And that speaks, some people call it modest. They speak about that aspect of wanting in the presence of the Lord, you feeling so naked, you want to cover yourself with something. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden, the moment sin came, they wanted to cover themselves with wings. These beings, we do not have any record of them ever falling into sin, but they are standing before such a majestic one, such a... Uh, a, a, a pure God that they feel the need to cover themselves. And by the way, that uh, is still uh, captured in the what we call the, the, the garment of the priest. Because in the Old Testament, there was a peculiar requirement, actually two portions of scripture that you may need to study a bit if you really want to know some of the aspects of uh, now like uh, 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 Paul tells Timothy that you may know how to behave in God's house which is and then he begins to describe one portion of scripture says when you go to the land of your promise 
you shall not approach or rather you shall not make steps on my altar any altar that was used to sacrifice to the lord the bible says it would only have uh, what do you call that uh, whatever grandeed we come a ramp but not stairs and then if you go to leviticus the the reason is lest as you climb the stairs you expose your nakedness of course you remember the priest in those days there was only this uh, long linen garment that more or less looked like a, t- a very long t-shirt so according to moses if now they were to lift their leg as they climbed the stairs of course I don't need to go further than that. So the Lord forbade that that I would rather have you climb you know slowly we uh, evenly without you raising your foot. You may not understand that until now you come to some of the things in the New Testament that we are dealing with a God who is uh, mighty who is majestic and uh, uh, then you begin to realize we are not in the New Testament we are not just talking about now garments outward garments we are now talking about you understanding that as i approach this god there are things i need that modesty that these these creatures have then another peculiar statement is when now moses also added another scripture and said any priest who approaches the the altar to burn incense or to do anything they had to have king james calls them linen breeches in in our modern language they had to have some underwear on so that they don't expose their nakedness these are things in the bible by the way so you may wonder why would god talk about that i thought they always wore but no there was a reason why god had to specifically tell them that and in both cases he says so that as you approach you do not expose your nakedness before that throne now in the old testament they were dealing with what they can see in the new testament we are dealing with a god we cannot see and both uh, even peter they begin to talk ab- about the immortal the invisible the all wise god and uh, so much light dwells with him that any time you want to approach him you feel you are naked you feel you need to cover yourself you you feel that's where the the the, the pride of man actually comes to its end and like uh, isaiah you begin to feel you are undone you are you are not worthy if these uh, uh, living creatures who know no sin cover their faces how much more human beings who have already the the seed of sin in them that is from adam and then their own issues that are bound to to be exposed before that god then the other thing i want you to see is this that they had eyes within that's just the description of what he had uh, already said of course this like i said speaks about that uh, aspect that in the presence of that god you know you are you are being watched you know i use the analogy of a uh, security camera cameras if you go to a place and there are cameras all around you know there are some eyes watching you from whichever angle from whichever corner that's why sometimes by the way some of the things that john saw will uh, begin to give some meaning to now some descriptions or rather some uh, call them concepts or principles that are taught clearly in the new testament that god cannot be mocked you know because from whatever angle you approach him there are eyes on you so before you begin to tell god you know oh god uh i've arrived and you know i have been busy for you i mean there are eyes watching you he knows where you have been so instead of pretending why don't you just come clean because you don't need by the way one of the greatest revelations you will ever get about prayer is not even how to pray with this language and uh, you know it is how to understand that in the presence of god you don't need corners you don't need pretense you don't need sorry to say make up he knows you you are your big nose and all so before you begin to tell him how you have a smart nose why don't you just understand there are eyes all over so let me approach him with that aspect you remember those two guys described by jesus the pharisee and the the tax collector well jesus was not justifying you becoming a tax collector actually at the end of the day he said at the end 
of that prayer, one of them went home justified. Justified means God was able to look at him and say, now, yeah, that is a prayer I can listen to because this guy has just come plain simple and said, Lord, I am a sinner. You know, uh, Jesus, because the issue was about being open before the Lord. It was not about about uh, sin. So don't, don't say Jesus was saying, uh, if, if you just come and pray and go home a sinner, then even Jesus approved that. No, he was talking about one particular thing. The Pharisee was trying to approach God with what he thought was righteousness. I fast twice a week and, uh, you know, I tithe and uh, I do all these things. But the other guy went before the Lord and said, Lord, I don't even deserve to look at you. I am A, B, C, D. And the, the Lord said that other guy went home justified. When you talk about eyes all about, that should make you know it is, it is pointless for you to try to hoodwink God. You can uh, project another picture altogether when you are before men. You can create this image which, like we say, is larger than life. But anytime you approach this throne, this one, where there are eyes within and without, then you better just be yourself and tell the Lord now, forget about what these guys know or think they know about me. Here I come. And you know A, B, C, D. And I don't need to pretend I am not afraid. Sometimes it's good to tell God, you know how scared I am. These guys think I am this courageous person. But you know, you and me know how scared I am. You know how angry I am. You know I am ready to explode. I am so discouraged. I, am, I don't even understand you. At the end of the day, that aspect of eyes all around was to make you realize there is no hiding, there is no need to try uh, to pull anything before the presence of the Lord. Then he says, they do not rest day and night. Well, later we shall realize there was no day, no night in uh, New Jerusalem or in heaven or whichever now description, description you choose to, uh, to make. But what I want to mention is this. Because this one has been used a lot by many people to try to describe life in heaven. But you need to be careful and realize that this is the work of the four living creatures. It doesn't say here, neither anywhere else as we shall see, that uh, now that is what, uh, what heaven is all about. Yes, later, and we shall see that aspect of uh, people worshipping the Lamb of God, blah, blah, blah. But I want you to see that these four living creatures, at least as for now, their work is absolutely just one duty. Day and night, they are worshipping, or rather they are making this proclamation, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I'm saying this because, let me jump to first. 10. That, oh, first, let me just read first 9 and 10 and then we go back there so that you connect. And when those four living creatures, or rather, when those living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him that sits on the throne who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that is sitting on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne. Now let me ask you a simple question. And, that, uh, and uh, then... We go back there. Now, this description says, these guys do not rest day and night, right? But every time they do that, the four living, or, or rather the 24 elders fall before the throne and they cast down their thrones, uh, their, uh, their, yeah, their thrones and begin to worship. But a few verses, John had just said that w when he looked around, there was the throne where God was seated, and there were 24 elders that were seated on the throne. So when do they sit on the throne and when do they fall down if the other uh, four living creatures 24-7 are worshipping and every time they worship, these guys fall? Now that's something to ponder. But I, I want you also to understand this. Whatever we call time only exists here on earth. In the presence of the Lord and the whole concept about God is that Time is not bound by time. He does not live within time. 
Time is meaningless. So when we talk about day and night, and you are talking of God, actually there is no day, there is no night. When you talk about they are worshiping all the time, and then these guys, one time they are seated, the other time, uh, every time these guys worship, the, the, the elders fall down. It is your limited mind may begin to try to capture that. So when do they sit down on their throne and wear their crown? When do they fall down and they cast down their crowns before the throne? Well, when we talk about the, 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 the presence of God, the issue of time as we know it, so that you begin to think at what time did they cast down their, did they rise from the floor if the other guys are worshiping uh, day and night? You need also to understand when you are talking about uh, the presence of God, Time does not exist. So this statement can only be understood if now you can try to conceptualize the fact that in the presence of God, there is no time. So when we say the, 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 the 24 elders fall down before the throne, and then you are saying they fall down after the four living creatures worship, and then you keep on saying the four living creatures do not rest. Then if in our own understanding of time, that would mean the 24 elders forever remain on that floor. But in the presence of the Lord, because time is now uh, uh, non-existent as we know it, then this becomes uh, uh, something that now you can understand in that context. The other thing that I want you to, to realize is the, the, the words they use. They say holy, holy, holy. And this, is, this cry is also found in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. When the Lord, when uh, Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. And, uh, you know, the, the four living creatures, there he calls them the seraphs and the, the cherubs. They keep on singing holy, holy, holy. I want to say something about this word which I think I alluded to. Because sometimes our understanding of some of the terminologies used is what gives us uh, some bit of confusion in understanding the Bible. Holy, in the way it is used in the Bible, has got nothing to do with the righteousness, in quotes, as we keep on thinking. When we say the Lord is holy, we are not talking about, how do you describe that, character. We are not talking about him being uh, righteous or sinless. Holy actually means set apart. It means in a class of himself. So when they are saying holy, 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 it's not a description of the, uh, 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 of the state of God in, terms of, uh, in as far as sin is concerned. And I need you to understand this because right from the Old Testament, when someone said this thing is holy unto the Lord, we were not talking about the state uh, when we talk about sin. So when we say, for instance, the tithe is holy to the Lord, we were not saying the tithe is sinless. We were, the Bible was talking about this is something set apart in a class of itself. Because when you begin to describe the wealth a Jew had, before you begin to count I own a hundred cows, 10% of that needed to be clearly marked and set apart, and that is why it was called the tithe is holy. You cannot say cows are holy, right? And that is the same uh, meaning when we talk about God being holy. God cannot, uh, I don't know whether you can understand this concept. The issue of sin, the issue of righteousness cannot come unless you introduce the issue of sin. And this is captured by Paul in the book of Romans, that uh, before the law came, then we were sinless. But when the law came, it imputed what? It imputed sin. And then he begins to describe, I did not know what covetousness was until the law said, thou shall not covet. And like our friend Dr. Mutlafi uh, from South Africa said, and, and he was describing what the Bible describes when uh, Paul talks about the law and sin. When he says the law, we know the law was made for sinners, right? Otherwise, the, reason, the only reason why God would say thou shalt not steal is because by nature you are a thief. You get me? You are a thief. That's why you need a law to tell you do not steal. I know you are prone to stealing. I know by nature, you know, 
you, like the way we say a scorpion stings because it is a scorpion. You steal because you are a thief. And that's why you need a law forbidding you. Thou shall not steal. Now, when you talk about a creature that already is born a thief, an adulterer, a liar, and all the things when the Bible says do not do this. By the way, when Paul says the law was made for sinners, you should think seriously about that and realize every single law God has said do not do this, you are that. Before you begin to say me, uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a liar. Actually, if you were never a liar, God would never say thou shall not lie. You cannot be forbidden from what you do not have capacity and the power to do, right? Now, if you were to now begin to try to describe God, or the word holiness, in terms of uh, how pure you are, then you realize then you, are, you, you cannot mention the word sin and God in one sentence. You cannot, because God is, uh, cannot sin. He, the, the aspect of sin cannot even apply to him. So when we talk about God being holy, it's not a description of his character, of his uh, uh, whatever now sin, if you were to, the, the, the issue of sin does not arise. Holy means something set apart, something unique, something in a class of its own. And that's why, now let me go back to the issue of tithe, for instance. I, I will be taking you back to some Old Testament scriptures to try to also help you understand some of the concepts. You realize in the Bible, it was very clear, like Malachi and all the scriptures, if anyone were to offer, to bring an offering from the flock, the Bible says it must be blameless, right? You cannot bring a crippled animal. Actually, even Malachi forbids that. Or something with a single eye or whatever. You were, you were forbidden by law. Any offering made to the Lord had to be perfect, but not the tithe. The tithe said that the law, what we call the law of the tithe was this. You would count as they come into the, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the, the pen or the, 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 the bomber where you are keeping them. And the Bible says you were, how they used to do it is, uh, you know, the, that shepherd's stuff. You would be counting one, two, three as they end. Nine, the tenth one, the Bible says, whether it is crippled, whether it is, it has one eye, you cannot change it. But if you decide to give an offering, forget about the tithe, now you could not offer a blind one. But if by any chance as they were entering and you were now picking the tithe because they would be coming in, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the tenth one you pick aside, if by any chance, the tenth one happened to be a cripple. That's why the Bible now repeated, the tithe is holy. It cannot be exchanged. It cannot be redeemed. It can, you cannot do, even if it falls on the one you love most, you cannot now say, God, uh, let's now. Because the idea is to give you 10 out of 100. Let me replace this one with a, a, another one, a, a better one. This one is a cripple. Actually, the Bible say, if you try to do it, both the one you are trying to redeem and what you are bringing in as the redemption become holy. And that's why now he said, if anyone tries to redeem the tithe, then first he must add 20% to it. And both whatever you were trying to redeem and now the 20%, so you end up giving 30%, which doesn't make sense. And the reason was, as you were counting, the one that falls on the tenth one, that is holy, that is set apart. I'm trying to show you that when we talk about holy, 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 we are not talking about character of God. We are talking about the fact that he is in a class of himself. He is set apart. He is unique. He, is, he cannot be in any other. You cannot bring gods and now begin to say, we have this God and this God and this God and then this God who is our God. He, he cannot be in any classification. So when they say holy, 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 and of course I, you, that t takes you back to the number three, uh, you know, as we saw it, you are not talking about the, the nature, the character. You are talking about the fact that uh, you are describing God as someone who is by himself, set apart. Holy means set apart. That's why even when you talk about the priest being holy, it was, in the Old Testament it was never about uh, 
being sinless because that's why they had to bring an offering. But the Bible said from the very beginning, God told Moses, take the house of Aaron and uh, do what? Set them apart so that they are holy to the Lord. It was not a description of their, in quote, sinlessness, although they still had to offer sacrifices to cleanse themselves. It was a description of the fact that uh, the priesthood was something set apart in a class of its own. So when you count the other tribes, these are guys who are set apart. And when they say it three times, these uh, living creatures, it was now that, you remember the word three, it was now that emphasis. By the way, part of the, uh, 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 or rather one way to understand uh, the Bible is to, if you can uh, get a good book on the idioms and the usage of the Hebrew language. Of course, if you want to go deeper. Because some of the phrases used, like in the Old Testament, unless you understand the usage, you will think God is just, a, or rather you'll think the Bible is just wanting to take us around in circles. Why would you keep on saying holy, holy, holy? To repeat that three times to the, in the Hebrew language had a, a divine meaning altogether. When you say something twice, you remember how the Lord would call Samuel, Samuel. It had a meaning. And that's why either when the, 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 in the Hebrew language, that's now part of the study I've done on the idioms and the usage of the Hebrew language, Whenever they mentioned something twice, or they used a ruler to describe something, it had got nothing to do with quantity. It had something to do with the quality. For instance, let me give you a, a funny one that now I found when I was studying this. You remember when the Bible talks about Rebecca being a beautiful lady, and the same is used about Sarah. Now, in the Hebrew, it does, it does not just uh, record it the way we have, that uh, and, uh, uh, Sarah was beautiful to behold. No. It says Sarah had faces. Now, because to them, once you use faces in Prulo, you are not saying she has a face here and a face here. You are saying her face is worth uh, mentioning twice. You, you get the idea? So when we, you say this, this girl has faces in the Hebrew, you would mean now she is beautiful. You get me? That's just a part of giving you some appetite for some deeper work. Uzipende hii mambo ya chwara chwara ya kukimbianga na kamustari kamoja. The Bible says, let's pause there. Why does the Bible say? No, just try to get something deeper. And uh, you, there are may, very many commentaries uh, and uh, uh, historical books and uh, things about the, the language. For instance, you remember that statement? Uh, allow me to blow your, uh, some of your, your religious thought. You remember that statement we keep on saying, and the word of the Lord shall be precept upon precept, line upon line? You'll be surprised. If you have the NIV uh, and you look at the margin, how they have described that, you realize actually that scripture does not mean anything close to how we keep on trying to interpret. That it means to tailewa pole pole, line upon line. No. Actually, if you read the whole context and the NIV in the margin explains it very well, that is an idiom. It is now the equivalent in the modern language is the word of the Lord shall be blah, 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 blah. And that's why it says the next verse which we don't, which we carefully don't want to read when we want to describe as it is understand. You realize it says, and, and that's why they will not understand the word of the Lord. Because to them, it is like someone singing a song. It is blah, blah, blah. Hebrew, it says it is kaf la kaf, sap la saf. It was just a play with words. Blah, 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 blah. They don't, to them, you are just uh, meaning, you are saying meaningless words. Anyway, that's for another day. That's for module two. So, holy here has got nothing to do with the sin. It is a description that God is set apart in a class of himself. Now, the, 
the reputation, of course, I say it is, uh, is common in Jewish uh, language as a way of laying divine emphasis. When you actually use three times that, you are now actually laying divine em emphasis on that. And uh, then they ascribe that holiness to just one being, Lord God Almighty. Uh, that is the same description you find in the scriptures when... Uh, the, the, the Jews wanted now to, I'm trying not to bring too much of other portions of scripture. But you remember how Israel would, especially in their worship, would use different names to describe God. Sometimes calling him the Holy One of Israel. Then they tell you the Lord, the most holy God. Then sometimes the, uh, the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. It is because they understood that every time you addressed him using any of those different titles, you were, of course, taking a certain direction. So when now they say, the one who is holy is the Lord God Almighty. The combination of those three titles in one, as one name now elevates God to, listen, just, let's just use English. He is the Lord with capital L, meaning if you are talking of other people with authority as lords, then this is the, the Lord, the one of them. Then he is not just Lord because even on earth we have lords. He is God, meaning now he is the one who is uh, self-sustaining, he is the one who was not created, he is the one when you are talking about the other gods, that's, when, that's why the, 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 the prophets would mock the idols of the world, and we keep on singing that. All the other gods, they are the works of men. They were created by somebody. But the Lord our God he is the self-sustaining. He was not created. He created uh, himself, if you can talk about something like that. And he doesn't need, the other gods will need someone to carry them from this place to the other. He doesn't need anyone to sustain him. That makes him God. Then, when you talk about the Almighty, we are distinguishing him from the other mighty beings, including people, powers, thrones. That's why now, uh, when uh, Daniel gets that vision of the Prince of Persia, the angel says that, that he has been fighting with the, the mighty Prince of Persia because there is some might in that prince, and that's why for 21 days we've been fighting, because I am an angel, he is a fallen angel. But now when you talk about God, you don't even use the word mighty, you now bring in that other word, almighty, meaning now, he, that's in another class, that's in another level altogether. The devil has some might, so don't, don't begin to say, he's a, of course we want to see how powerless he is, but actually he has some... <laughs> No, seriously. Sometimes you need to, you, you, that's a description, uh, you know, about our faith, but we do know, even up to this day, the devil retains some power. I mean, th that, those are things that are for real. I, I've just come from home and uh, we are dealing with some funny stuff. There's another neighbor there who was Lipatigana uh, Uchawi Mwingi Sana, including Figanja Zawatu, you know, Mikono Yawatu, and everyone is like, where did she get these hands from? And uh, all that. And uh, you begin to realize she used some power to dig in the grave or whatever. I don't know how she got them, but uh, that tells you they have some power, they have some might. But then our God is all mighty. The devil has some power. You remember what Jesus said when he rose again from the dead? All power in heaven on earth. And under the earth, meaning now the lower levels, has been given to me. So the devil has some power. People have some power. When someone tells you, I can do this to you, yes, they have some power. So before you tell them they are powerless, uh, understand they have some power. Maybe to break your nose or to make your life miserable using their, their authority here on earth. But then, when we talk about the Lord being almighty... We, we are talking about the sum total of all, uh, can we call it might? Now the sum total of whatever you call might. You bring all of it together. Now that 
is what we are talking about. So when we describe him as being holy, 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 he is in a class of himself to start with. Then that classification, that honor can only be attributed to the one now that you are saying, the Lord God Almighty. Those are three very uh, high ranking titles in one line given to one person or not one person, one being. And that's why now to the Jew and even to John, by saying now you are talking about the Lord God Almighty, you are talking of we do not uh, recognize Caesar as a Lord and of course you realize the witness of the Christian at this stage was uh, Jesus is Lord because the Roman uh, 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 the, the people of the Roman Empire they are, they are is it motto or whatever they used, they kept on saying Caesar is Lord. So the fight between the church and Rome was when a group of people inside the Roman Empire kept on chanting and singing loudly that uh, it's not Caesar. Jesus is Lord. So it was like you are talking of another Lord and we only know one Lord, Caesar. But they were saying there is another Lord. And his name is Jesus, the one you crucified. You remember the description by both Peter and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Paul. That the one you crucified, the Lord, uh, God the Father has raised him from the dead and has made him both Lord and Savior. And then they begin to say, in the name of that Jesus, the one you crucified, who is now Lord, this cripple stands before your wall. They kept on insisting he is Lord, meaning he, he, he bears command above the others. And then they conclude by saying, he is the one who was and is and is to come. Now, that will uh, come into sharp focus later because there will be a description just to give you a, pre, a foretaste of what uh, uh, comes later. There will be a description of... Uh, what now he calls the, 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 the beast and uh, the false prophet. Among the descriptions given is uh, he belongs to the seventh, but he is the eighth. And then he begins to say, and then you know his number. Well, the description he was trying to give was that of uh, one of the Roman emperors who came after Nero. You know, Nero was one of the famous ones and notorious. And now... When this other emperor came, the, the myth was that this is Nero reborn. So they kept on saying this is the one who was and now is. But they know he's not going to live forever. So John sees a, hears a description rather about now the one seated on the throne. He's not even like Nero. This is the one who was. He is now and he is the one to come. In other words, you are talking of eternity. You are not talking of we are waiting for this, uh, the, the, a big one who is going to come. We are talking about one who was, even now he is there. And when you talk about the future, he is still the one. That's why when we talk about God being eternal, we are saying he was there, he is here, and he, he shall still be, be there. We as human beings and even the other things described by people, they will tell you of how great so and so was. I mean, I have no problem with the people remembering heroes and all that. But every time we have anniversaries of people who did great things, the U.S. have their what they call Martin Luther King Day to remember a great hero. But even if you listen to all the speeches you try to elaborate the dream he had, the fact of the matter is he was, but he's not there. If you are talking of those who are still alive, then you will say in their heydays they discovered this. They gave to us as the scientific world, they gave us this, and now he's an old man, so he was and he is, but then we don't know when he's going to die, right? Even when you talk about heroes here in Kenya, we were remembering the other day, is it this week or last week, uh, this guy from the land of uh, Migori, this uh, uh, Kothek guy or something, the one who, I don't know what he was. And uh, he's a big name in Kenya. There is even a street by that. We have Kenyatta Avenue. We have, but those are people who were, they are not there. 
So when we talk about God being the one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come, it is just a description of eternity in poetic language, right? Now let's go to the next verse. And when those living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him that sits on the throne who lives forever and ever, I, I, I will want you to keep on putting these markers in your mind. We have just said that they do not rest day or night. They keep on saying what? Holy, holy, holy. Now he says, these living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne. What I want you to realize, and this is part of the confusion that uh, especially when we begin to talk about worship. When we talk about giving God glory, it does not necessarily mean you mention the word glory, like we keep on saying, we give you glory. Because really, by the way, if you were seriously to think about that, <laughs> yeah, it's good to think hard about some of these things. If you are to seriously think about that statement, you would see how foolish it appears. You cannot give something you don't have. So how much glory do you have, Emmanuel, before you tell God, I give you glory? From where? He is the one who is glorious. He is enthroned in glory. So that statement, they give glory to God, is, does not necessarily mean they, they say the, act, the words, we give you glory. No, anytime they describe God uh, in this way, for instance, holy, 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 that makes God now, in the eyes of those who are hearing, receive glory. So at the end of the day, that's why we keep on saying, worship is actually, the more we keep on describing the aspects of God, that is now what gives him glory. You don't have of necessity to say, Lord, I give you glory. Receive all the glory. Sometimes just by describing, you are the, like this musician, you are the indescribable God. You are beyond description. In heaven, that counts, you know, in that aspect that this person has given the glory to God because he is giving descriptions about God that are not and cannot be given to any other being. That's why, without any apology, I find it a bit offensive and uh, insulting when our sister from Tanzania would use the same, same description about Unitas that she is using about Jesus. Umenifanya ningare, yes. Then the next minute, umenifanya ningare, Unitas. You are putting God, you are putting Jesus and Unitas at the same level. That uh, uh, part of the Ungara Unaona is from this Jesus. Uh, another part of this kungara is from Unitas. You are making them, ad, uh, you know, as, as if they are whatever gods or whatever they are at the same level. And seriously, that becomes, uh, if you now begin to understand when uh, in the Old Testament, Psalms 96, for instance, give to the Lord, O ye men, give to the Lord the glory due to his name. That means I cannot use the same, I cannot ascribe the same uh, fame, the same whatever, to another thing, the, the same that I have, I have used to ascribe to God, because that means I am now putting him at the same level. It's like saying you, you are in a meeting and you don't want to offend any political side, so you say, uh, you know, um, the way I am because NASA helped me, and then you realize Jubilee is there, so you say, and also Jubilee has done this, because you are trying to not to offend any of the saints. You get me? So you cannot be, when they are saying, they give glory to God, when they say holy, 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 and Lord God Almighty, of course they are placing him in a class of himself, and that gives him glory. Then it says, and honor. Honor, uh, sometimes is interpreted uh, uh, as, a, as a something due, that uh, you recognize this is something due to this person. I honor this person. It's not like he's demanding. I recognize this is due to him. Honor, uh, in the Greek, sometimes is also uh, interpreted as, a, as payment, meaning they have worked for it. That's why you remember that statement uh, where Paul says, 
is it Paul or, or, or Peter, that the elders who rule well consider them worthy of what? Double honor. By the way, and George, you should listen to this. Uh, there, honor means salary. If you do a study of that Greek word, there, double honor, if you were to use simple language, that means you count them worthy of double salary because they have, that's why he said, you know, it is in connection with where he has just said, thou shall not muzzle the ox that treads the grain. So when we are talking about honor, we are talking about something someone deserves, someone uh, as and someone is worthy of that. So when they are saying, holy, holy are you, it's not like they are flattering God. It is they are declaring what actually is something that he deserves. And that's why later you shall realize what we call the song of the lamb and Moses will be just that song where it says, worthy is the lamb to receive blessings, glory, honor, wisdom, and thanks. And then they say, because you redeemed us you, with your own blood. You bought us and redeemed us to belong to God. That song simply says that when we stand before the Lamb and say he is worthy to receive all these things, we are giving the reason it is because he did A, B, C, D to deserve that. And that now becomes now what we call the song of the Lamb because he died. You are worthy because you died. Now, Look at uh, what the description given to Satan, Lucifer. He, he begins by saying, I will ascend to the highest heavens. I will make my seat above the throne of God. I will be worshipped like the most high. So he does not deserve, he did not do anything for us to say, worthy are you, Lucifer, to receive A, B, C, D. What did you do to earn this? But when you come to Jesus, it is very clear. Worthy is the lamb. Why? For you died. You did A, B, C, D. You redeemed us. So the honor here is because he has earned. God is actually worthy of our worship. The devil demands worship. God is worthy. So he, that's why he doesn't demand. He knows he is worthy. And those who know him re, uh, really well, he does not need to demand. They will give it because they know he is worthy of that. He, they, they don't need to strike, you know, like... Uh, this other guy who is fond of striking. And I don't know you, Jama, which way to Sosion. Because uh, the, the person who is paying should know you are worthy. You see now why when we talk about Lucifer and Jesus, it's they are worlds apart. One of them is worthy of worship. You don't see anywhere, actually Jesus telling people, you worship me, I'm an Ikuchape. But you go to the book of Matthew, John, you realize actually of all people, Satan was demanding worship from Jesus. Yet he did not deserve. He was telling him, fall down and worship me. So even if it's not written, you know, it's like uh, Jesus was like, why? Why should I worship? What have you done? How have you earned that from me? And then he tells him, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord only. Because he alone is worthy. He alone has earned. He alone deserves that honor. Let me not go to that. And thanks to him. You should ask yourself, these are not human beings, so they cannot say we are thankful because we were once seen us. No, they are thankful because being creatures, that means they were created. So the, the, the creature actually owes, if I may use that word, owes a lot of gratitude and thanksgiving to the one who created him, regardless of uh, if you are the lion, the, the, the ego, the, the calf, the man. I mean, you don't see any of them saying, I, I would have worshipped you better if I looked like the, uh, the lion. Why did you make me the ego? Now, all of them realize it's worthy to be given what? Thanks. Because that is something that they, they begin to, it is from within. And then it just concludes by saying, to him that sits on the throne, because God, from the word go, when we saw the throne, I, the, the heavens were opened, and I saw a throne, and the one who sat on it. Now, he, he, he still goes back to that and says, to him that sits on the throne, and who lives what? 
forever and ever. Because we have already said he is the one who was and is and shall ever be. One thing about God, uh, anytime someone begins to encounter God, you see it in the Psalms, you see it in, the, in whatever you call songs or prayers in the Bible. People do not get tired of uh, what we think is repetition. You have just, just said, holy, holy, holy is the one who was and is and shall ever be. Now you are saying and you live forevermore. It's like it's repetition. But of course, you know, even in poetry, there are those phrases you'll keep on repeating. Oh, let me give you a very good example. You remember that song where, uh, where, where it's a, psalm, uh, a song of Asaph? Psalms what? I don't remember, the, but it is repeated several times. When they would keep on saying, and that's the song that Jehoshaphat and uh, uh, his army sang when they went to battle. The priests would, the soloists would just say, give thanks to the Lord. And the congregation would say, for his mercy, it do us forever. To the one who redeemed us from uh, the bondage of Satan, of Pharaoh. And the congregation would repeat, for his mercy, it do us forever. To the one who redeemed us, for his mercy, it do us forever. It may sound a bit repetitive to you, but, uh, and that's one of the secrets of worship, you guys. Sometimes you don't have to sing a million songs. Sometimes when you are really in sync with the Spirit, he can tell you to repeat his masses, uh, it do us forever for the whole day. And at the end of the day, you will know his mercy it do us forever. But we are too quick. We want to sing ten stanzas. I tell you the truth. Have I ever told you that one time at, when I had some serious trouble with the registrar at the science department, I went and prayed because the guy told me I had I had failed another, a certain unit, and I knew. I had already talked to the lecturer, and he told me you didn't fail. But I went there, of course, there are those stories of grades being switched. So he told me I have an F. I told, me, I told him on this, no. This one, no, I will not do the receipt. And I went, he abused me, called me names. We shall see who your yes work. And I went away. I went to A1. That's, that was our church hall after preps. 4.30, guys walked out. I started praying. And I was praying for that, of course. Then at a certain point in my prayer, I just felt this song by Darlene Zedge, that nothing compares to the promise that I have in you. It's a long song, but that's the phrase that came to me. Nothing compares to the promise I have. I didn't even keep on just that. You know, I sang that the whole night, up to six in the morning, just that. And by morning, I had no voice, but I was so much lifted to know, not a computer, not a registrar, not even the university council, compares to the promise that I have in God. Amen. So I walked back to that office after three weeks, told him, check again. He told me, did you do the receipt? No. He told me nothing has changed. I told him, check. So he went to the computer and he was like, something is wrong. Your grades have changed. I told him, that is the Jesus you told me to go. I mean, I was saved by a phrase. I didn't need to sing. Well, I'm not telling you, you begin chanting just one word. But, uh, well, you, you get my message, right? So anyway, you'll see a lot in this book that has got everything to do with worship and many other things because this book actually is full of worship. What is the lamb, you know, to the one who sits enthroned, blah, 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 and the beast demanding worship. Well, on the other side, the one who actually should be worshipped, nowhere do you see him saying, I demand, let the world worship me. But the beast will cause everyone to worship what? Him. Why will he force people? Because he doesn't deserve. He doesn't He's not worthy, so he has to force people. But the one who is really worthy, they just fall down. People on earth, people in heaven, the living creatures, the 24 elders, they just fall down and worship him and say, worthy are you for you died, for you redeemed us. For you. I mean, you are worthy because of ABCD. Let's stand on our feet. I pray that as we continue to study this book, your heart will be changed. You will understand him better. Father, I pray 
that as we continue to study this book, you will enable us to understand you more. I pray may we know you the way John uh, uh, began to know you as he saw that throne. May we know that you are the Lord God Almighty, the one that was and is, the one that shall ever be, the one who is holy, 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 set apart from anything we know. Thank you, Lord, because this knowledge is going to bring us ever so close to you. In Jesus' name we pray.